Hey there! How are you guys doing? It's Christy and I'm filming this from Pisa. So I thought I would just do a little update and before I go out tomorrow and do some videos of the town itself. First of all, um, the room that I'm in here, it's fine. It's basically like a classic dorm room sort of hotel. Very small, very European. But what is interesting is, I don't know if you can see, yeah I think you can. Oh, we'll get out of the way here. There's a really interesting artwork. Instead of just uh, putting a painting up, they've just painted on the wall, which is pretty cool. Um, saves, I guess, you know, changing the artwork or worrying about anybody stealing it when it's just right there. And then also I thought I'd give you a little bit of a glimpse of, I'll back up a bit and see, uh, get kind of the full effect of the window. It's, you know, um, really high ceiling sort of typical thing that I'm sure in the summertime really makes a big difference. But the, to be honest, the weather here has been, well, better than most places in Europe, but not exactly brilliant. And uh, yeah, this, this is the street where I'm staying here and a little bit of a look around at so it's a very narrow, narrow alleyway that the hotel is sort of um, within and right downtown Pisa so really beautiful very centrally located really nice um, you have a sense of it's windy here today uh, nice weather but um, could be warmer in my opinion I think that's, yeah, it's a, I think that's enough of the outside. Okay, let's turn this off now. We're back. <laughs> I'm making the video because we've wrapped up our session for the joint workshops. And the joint workshop that I participated in was about political leaders and communication. The group itself was a, a spread of people, some of who were like my, well, I was the person there who was sort of doing political behavior. There are other people there who were focused on voters. There were also specialists in communications, media communications from Loughborough University and uh, people from Sydney, Australia and around the world who had come to participate in this. And because of my activism online in terms of trying to provide feminist content made by feminists that reflects at least this feminist's perspective on why I'm a feminist and why I think it's valid. I was reminded again about the usefulness of feminist critique in an academic setting. And I think that that is something that people who criticize feminism, who criticize feminism based on what they see on Tumblr or on social media, don't, it's a big blind spot. They, they don't get it. While I was here, we had, I think in the end, 11 papers. I'm going to try to set up a little bit more because, hey, that's a little bit more natural. Otherwise, I'm like really looking up. There were four papers out of the 11 that we did that used feminist critique to evaluate empirical evidence. And the reason that that's important is because a feminist critique is the basically the only way to problematize or examine evidence that is specifically designed theoretically to illuminate power relations or differences based on sex and also gender differences, gender norms in the society, in practices that can we can reflect upon. I mean feminist theory is actually critical to understanding economics, to understanding sociology, anthropology, uh, psychology, in terms of like the gendered stuff, not the brain stuff, not like a neural psychology, political science, communications. Any time in the social world where there are power bases in the, in the past that have been justified through men's competence over women or any situation where men, it was the natural place for men, it was an unnatural place for women, and vice versa. Things that were natural for women like being a nurturing parent and uh, changing nappies, you know. Those were barriers to men who wanted to be good fathers and take their kids out because they couldn't change the nappies because all of the nappy changing or the diaper changing facilities were in the women's bathrooms. That's something that you can really only Problematize, you can really only analyze with feminism. Now, people might say, no, that's not true, that you can somehow do it with egalitarianism. Egalitarianism doesn't provide you with any framework for critiquing power distribution or holding power or wealth or status 
on any basis. Uh, it just says that people should be equal. It's sort of the first step. And then the next step might be, let's say, racial equality. And you can look at differences in how a dominant population in most Western societies, it's the white population, um, how they experience the justice system or police interactions or job um, applications in terms of success. And you can look at how non-white groups perform. But you can't just do that through egalitarianism. Egalitarianism is just a starting point, and then you'd look at racial equality. Another example is looking at LGBT rights, and and we're this increasingly um, pop or not popular, but this increasingly widespread discussion on transgendered issues or transgendered rights. Egalitarianism doesn't get you there. You have to talk about things like sexual orientation, gender norms, gender identity, and that requires you actually specify the problem in a way that's based on gender norms and identity and sexual orientation and rights and, and dominant sexual orientation norms and in how we work on these in a society to make everybody equal. The same thing with feminism. Feminism is a way, to, it is the theoretical framework that allows us to examine men and women both based on sex, biological sex differences, just raw aggregate level sex differences, men and women in a career or in an institution, in a degree program, and also the gender norms around what it means to be a man or a woman, what it means to be feminine and masculine in a particular society in a particular time, or the multiple ways in which one can be masculine and feminine. And as an example of that, one of the papers that we looked at today was someone who was looking at the role of parenthood. What does it do to a candidate to be a parent, depending on if that person is a man or a woman? And this researcher was looking at the British context and how, ed, um, how people were described as being um, a, a good parent or the, the parent, the, the, the idea that they were parents was somehow legitimizing their political standing. So if you contrast a woman who has children to a woman who doesn't, in the media coverage in a recent political leaders uh, race that happened in the UK, you see that women, the woman who had the child was using the childlessness of her opponent against her. This is a very gendered discourse. And another way that you can examine it is by, say, contrasting the way that David Cameron was portrayed as a sort of family man and monogamous and he and masculine and a strong leader, whereas Ed Miliband was somehow different from that and there were slights against him and his sexual past and also whether or not he was, you know, slurs against him, trying to feminize him in some ways in certain right-wing media outlets. You have to have a feminist. The only thing that allows you to analyze that is feminist theory. That's it. That's the only framework because those are the people who did the work. It was feminists who said, hey, look at these differences and where do these differences come from and who reinforces them, who reproduces them, who challenges them, what are they challenged with? That's all feminist critique and feminist, uh, feminist analysis. Another paper that was examined looked at how much media time men versus women candidates received in the last election. And what was an interesting finding from, from what I could see is that when women were able to get onto a television program or a media newspaper um, interview or a radio program, they spoke just about as much as men. There was very little um, systematic difference in the speaking time that men and women received once they got on air. The problem was, it's like women only got on air, like they were 20% of the people who got on air, and 80% of the people who got on air were men. So the problem in that case is gatekeepers. It's not that when women get onto these broadcast networks that they're somehow not um, being, uh, giving a chance to speak. They're just not being invited on. And that's a problem of representation. So I, there was a really good um, conference and really good and preliminary findings. The people who are working on them are going to be developing them further and sending them through for peer review. But you know, nobody in that room objected to the, the theoretical frameworks that were being used to evaluate the empirical data that were presented. And it reinforced for me this complete disconnect between people who want to tell universities what to teach, who have never stepped foot inside of a sociology class, let alone 
designed a sociology class, let alone sat, um, you know, got a, um, a PhD and sat on a department meeting where the curriculum was established and where those ideas fit in within the larger pedagogic goals of a degree scheme. And, you know, it's for me, to be honest, um, the petition that's been going on right now and the debate around it is laughable because nobody at the university level is taking it seriously. And they're not taking it seriously because um, the topics that are being touched upon, things like feminist theory, they're academically valid, they're empirically valid, and they're used across the social sciences to do really good and interesting work that is based in evidence, that is properly theorized, pro properly operationalized, and can be um, and are the source of uncovering facts and establishing a basis of knowledge about phenomenon. And that's what science does. It's a knowledge production process. It doesn't kind of matter if you're doing valid work. Again, the object of inquiry doesn't determine whether or not it's scientific. It's the process by which you come to produce knowledge. So those are just some thoughts I've had reflecting on being immersed again, you know, for several days in a row in purely academic discourse and standards and evaluations and the fact that feminism is vital in these critiques in order to bring out the things like the, um, you know, patriarchal norms as to what makes a good leader. The idea that a good leader is somehow by default an, in a male body and then women have to either be are judged against that and if they're too masculine then they're unnatural and if they're too feminine they're weak and they can never really be that ideal politician if the ideal politician is always based on a male body first and foremost so that was it just some thoughts I promised to do more videos in prep for uh, being away and I didn't but I finally figured out today how to get internet access in my hotel room. Most days I've been up before seven to either read or prep for the day's sessions and then I don't get home until seven or eight at night and I'm too tired to do anything to, f to figure out how the Wi-Fi works and I'm not here enough to use it. So now that the things have wrapped up and I've got a little bit of time, I thought I would make a little hello video and put these thoughts out there for people to take and do what you want. I'm sure there'll be a lot of criticism in the comments because every time I mention feminism, there's criticism. That's just how, I, how it happens. But what I do plan on doing tomorrow, because I do have some time off and I've really only seen uh, about, in terms of Pisa, all of what I've seen I c is a 10 minute walk from my hotel room and from our conference center, which is a six minute walk from me. So I want to get out tomorrow and get uh, going on a video postcard, get you guys some shots of the city, of the tower, of course. I'm going to do some research tonight on some of the best things to see in Pisa. And yeah, tomorrow I'm going to get out there and do a documentary sort of postcard video for my own enjoyment, but also so that you guys can get a little feeling of what it's like to be here in Italy. Is that about it? Um, other things, I had gnocchi for the first time. That was exciting. I'm from Wisconsin. I don't. I don't eat gnocchi. Like, like my my background is Polish, and you know we've got German influence in Wisconsin. Those are the big influences we have. And um, I had one of those like aha moments going for uh, dinner the other night. I think it was, or going for lunch during one of the breaks. Uh, and the group had gone out, and I I kind of missed them, so I was going to just go out and end up meeting a colleague who was having lunch. But as I was walking along, okay, well there's Italian, and there's Italian looking for something to eat, and looking for something that was an Italian, and realizing, yeah, that's not going to be so easy in Italy. <laughs> I should probably just <laughs> eat as much Italian food as I'm while I can while I'm here, as I can while I'm here. And, and enjoy it and hopefully not put on too many calories with that. But yeah, the food so far has been really enjoyable and, and having, yeah, sort of the authentic gnocchi here in town was, was really nice. It was a good first experience with it, having not had it before. Other than that, yeah, um, pizza's good. Most of the lunches here are like 10 euros. All of the restaurants seem to have settled on a, a price of um, 10 euros for lunch. 
So that makes it quite affordable to eat and there's a lot of variety here. The city is very friendly and enjoyable and I will have more to say perhaps after I make my video postcard tomorrow about what are the best things to do in Pisa or at least a few things you should do if you ever get to this way. That's about it. I think I'm ready to wrap up this video and to say to you guys, I've been Christy, you've been awesome, I will see you later.